should, should I ask the question now? Or? Um, go ahead. Okay, I guess I was curious to hear what your thoughts are on how like, the Venice Biennale also plays into sort of the global representation of the United States, because I'm aware that the State Department does fund that, and it seems to be for like a more privileged milieu, and so that there still is this continued project that goes on there, and how you see that sort of fitting in compared to the United States role in World Expos. So I actually was on the Venice Biennale U.S. Pavilion team. Did you know that? I, did. I was on the award-winning team for um, the 2012 Venice Biennale with the Institute for Urban Design, and I had written a um, grant to be the commissioner, and my friends won the grant, won the project. The whole reason why I did it was so that I could see how bad this process was. And so what I did was I joined their team and I basically raised money for the U.S. Pavilion for the Venice Biennale. And to give you an idea of how that ended, um, I, they gave us $100,000 and then um, we had to raise the rest of the money. But the other pavilions for all of the other national pavilions got at least around, um, I think it was varied between 300 to, to 2 million from their own country's government. We had to raise like as much as we could. We I think we ended up raising like 160 or something. Like no, we raised 60 or something, and I raised most of it. Um, it was, that's what we did. And people were heckling yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you stop this. Oh, doesn't even know it is So, <laughs> so you know, actually as faculty, I used to be the one that runs tech support for some of this stuff because um, being a filmmaker, you actually learn how to do a, solve a lot of problems. So we won an international award in the first time in the seven at the time it was a 75 year history of the Venice being architecture being in LA. And we did it because we literally, if you involve creative people, designers, you know, people who think out of the box. It doesn't matter if you don't have very much money or you have very little time. Beverly can answer about the fact that the same pavilion from Shanghai versus the one in Expo 67 was the equivalent of the same amount of money, so. <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, the, just what Nina's referring to is how much do these things cost and, and, uh, and uh, to your question, who funds them. Um, the a comment that was made that we we had uh, a very little time, 27 months, uh, and uh, a tight budget to do Shanghai. The amount of money that uh, in today's, or in 2010 dollars, uh, that uh, Expo 67 co cost would be $60 million, which was the same cost. And it was done in the equivalent amount of time. So um, what you had uh, as a problem in Shanghai and that you didn't have an extra 67 was uh, Jack Macy, uh, uh, under the auspices of the US government, he was both a foreign service officer and someone who was involved in the design profession at the same time, was able to assemble on behalf of the United States a kind of SEAL Team 6 of design. So that if you ran into a problem, you had people who were skilled and trained and could respond very quickly instead of what happened in Shanghai where you had people who, who didn't really have experience and everything became a major crisis. Uh, and, and so um, we, we're advocating that we kind of return to um, having as part of our um, a State Department representation or foreign service representation, people with dual competencies perhaps, <coughs> like someone in architecture and foreign service, someone who can be both uh, at the same time so that we have better representation. In terms of your question about um, uh, the Venice Biennale, uh, the Venice Biennale is funded by a group in the State Department that receives funding each year for its activities. Not a lot of money. Um, it, uh, it's uh, it's uh, ECA, it's called a group called ECA, which has nothing to do with um, uh, expos. Expos would be funded by Congress one needs to go to Congress directly and request a special appropriation specifically for that uh, event. So um, this is why the Venice Biennale folks get a 
maybe our hundred thousand dollars time this event happens um, because that's already been appropriated. That money has been appropriated. So it's really a kind of bureaucratic uh, issue with appropriation money. But there's a strange thing about the Biennale is that in some ways the United States underperforms under for these reasons, and yet other countries are doing really well. But when you look into the biographies of the people who are showing material or uh, e e exhibiting or even taking roles as curators, you find out that whilst they're representing other countries, they're deeply embedded in practice in the United States. So the United States is central behind the scenes, but appears to be uh, underperforming, and there are other countries that are now coming forward as the um, visual countries. Uh, I, I'm particularly impressed over recent uh, art biennales how China is coming forward as a uh, a capital of um, as a generator of visual culture with some very very impressive material. Especially as the last couple of uh, sessions, they've eased up on um, censorship and and let uh, people who with who have um, in the past been on government blacklists um, uh, exhibit and uh, it's really impressive uh, stuff coming forward. Yeah. So, I would just like to take one more point. If you're interested in this, uh, Lars Mueller published a book in uh, 2014 called uh, Office U.S. Uh, the uh, U.S. pavilion, uh, the, the, the one that occurred after the one that you were at in 2014, uh, traced the history of American architecture from 1914 to 2014 say, with this uh, uh, premise. In 1914, there was national architecture. You could identify if a building came from France or if it came from Germany, if it came from England or the United States. By 2014, everybody's buildings look alike. What happened? And their goal was to tell the story of how the influence of American architecture, American modernism, or American post-war modernism spread throughout the world, spread globally. How did that happen? And as part of their effort, they requested 10 projects from Jack Macy uh, that were put uh, up as expos or international exhibitions uh, outside the United States, which had such tremendous uh, reach, such a long arm, that um, they, uh, in, in fact, uh, were germinators of, of thought for uh, other nations. So uh, it's, it's an interesting book. Um, Mueller, 2014. Um, do we have any other questions? Oh, Carol, can you hand? Well, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. I, I just am so thrilled that you have this film complete and that the State Department and Congress are interested in having you show it to them. So I'm sure that you are going to be a force that will get our presence and architecture at World Expos and World Fairs <coughs> back up again. It, I, I, I'm sure you know that I have been, I'm not talking in this because it sounds so tinny when I do. Is that better though? <laughs> anyway, I'm just, uh, this is, uh, in the architecture department at USC wouldn't be thrilled with my idea, or I either, because I'm for the arts and architecture and international understanding, and, but if we don't solve the problem at some world's fair or world's expo, uh, instead of saying, okay, we're going ahead with this, even though we can already do the talent and dance, it looks like a sales pitch of our ten richest corporations, why couldn't it be architecturally completely ephemeral? I mean, no architects are not the idea, but why couldn't Dining tables, 51 American families, and all, and translators, and, and just a completely, just the idea, just the friendship reach out. You know, anyway, that's what I keep thinking about. Okay, but rather than have nothing, and rather than having poor architecture or people feeling that they're forced to sit in a movie theater, a little movie theater, I would put, put just a, a Fourth of July picnic under a tent. That's kind of what that's kind of what the Netherlands did in um, uh, Milan, actually, isn't it? They had kind of a uh, like a fair area with well, which was Jay, a great experience for people and really made people feel good about the Netherlands. Actually, they had 
beer. They had beer. That helped. So one of the things that we found in the research um, at the expo in Shanghai, uh, based on the, our visitor surveys, um, and also uh, look at uh, a lot of the secondary materials, how people uh, experience uh, different pavilions, and uh, specifically with regard to the USA pavilion, there, there was a bright spot. Yeah, the building, you know, was not impressive, but there was a very bright spot. Actually, it was something you know, along the lines you were talking about. It's the student ambassador program that was part of the pavilion. So you, you saw some of them uh, in the documentary that uh, they talked about their experiences and interactions, almost like a guides, you know, in a Disney <laughs> in a Disney park. They're like these guides, but they truly uh, represented. Uh, an aspect of America in the interaction uh, with the visitors that in our research suggests that uh, 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 left a very deep positive impression uh, because a lot of times these you know that when you go into these pavilions uh, you just go on there either it's a self-guided kind of experience or the way it's very structured you have to go to one two three you know it's a one directional kind of uh, experience but you usually don't get to interact with people as much. And uh, many pavilions uh, uh, do have uh, you know, staff and all of that, uh, but not to the extent, actually, uh, the, the USA Pavilion, uh, in terms of staffing with the student ambassadors, it's not a few of them. There are, so there are other pavilions also have the student program. I think is Israel also had, but they did not have that many. But the US Pavilion had a lot of students, and the students, uh, you know, they, they interact with our visitors quite you know, freely, and uh, and so even the comments that they made here, right? Uh, they were very frank, but it's that kind of a frankness, that that direct interaction, that truly made uh, uh, an impact in this particular case, uh, uh, regardless of the building or the whatever the exhibits uh, inside, uh, but the personal interaction. So that's that w I think that's very important that in the, even in the design of this how. The architecture facilitates human communications, and in this case, is involving our young people uh, interacting with uh, foreign visitors. Right. I, I would acknowledge that that is uh, very, very important. Um, just as a matter of, of uh, historical note, the United States has used uh, guides uh, who speak the local language at all international uh, exhibitions since 1951. So we have been. Technology is not the best in here. <laughs> okay, so anyways, um, my name is David Rivera. I'm one of the producers on the film. When I came in halfway through, and I didn't see you until now. <laughs> but she hasn't seen me since the last time I saw the film, mm -hmm. and Mina was very concerned about having a personal involvement in this documentary and putting herself into the documentary wow. now. And I could see that there was a vulnerability about her, that if she just showed how much she really cared, that that actual caring would connect with the audience and make us realize how much we actually really care too. And I think it's a testament to me in the spirit, her beautiful spirit, that she's able to connect with so many people to make them show that they care as well. So that's what I wanted to say. Thanks, <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> yeah. I think, are there any other questions? Oh. I just wondered if I was, did Frank Gehry say he would do it for free and, and on time? <laughs> <laughs> So I showed the pavilion. So Frank had not seen it. So his, his name was on what's called the RFP. It was actually the last qualified proposal that the State Department um, uh, qualified as one of the most experienced teams. And they were asked to submit some more information. But then they abandoned the RFP and hired whoever they wanted. Um, but when I showed Frank the results, he was absolutely livid, um, and he had forgotten about it by the time I interviewed him. But um, 
he didn't realize that, you know, what happened was Barry Howard, the guy that you saw talking very eloquently, had asked Frank if he could be on the team. But what happened was the State Department didn't think that architects could raise the money, so they ended up going to these other, uh, another team that was made up of BRC, Imagination Arts, and a bunch of others, and they, they were coming from the theme park world. And the theme park world is different from the design and innovation and creative spaces world. And basically, they didn't even think it was, they didn't want architecture. You, you heard what they said. They, they didn't think it was important. Um, what bothered me, and so when I showed this to Frank, and he was livid when he heard them say, when Nick Winslow said that he couldn't, that any team would not be able to do it in the time or the budget. So that really was really insulting as an architect. Pavilion that was the most technically sophisticated and most advanced was also the cheapest that we ever built, and that was in Osaka, Japan, in 1970, um, which was simultaneously not only the most technically advanced at that fair, but it was the largest clear span uh, structure ever built in human history. It was the lightest um, structure that. Uh, uh, we have ever produced. Uh, we have to wrap it up. Hmm? We have to wrap it up. Yeah, we're wrapping it up. Okay. We're just running late because we were starting late. Yeah. Uh, so I'm glad we finished this. Mm -hmm. It was the cheapest we've ever uh, produced. And at the end of that fair, we returned $100,000 to the U.S. Treasury. Wow. So, uh, just a big shout out. So, I mean, design architects, creative people are capable of doing a lot more. So on that note, I really appreciate you guys. We actually have sou like souvenir Buckminster Fuller bubblegum balls for everyone who's in the audience. So when you leave, make sure you pick one up, okay? All right, thank you so much.